Welcome, everyone. My name is Annette Johns, and I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Practice with the Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Social Workers. I have the honor of being the moderator for today's education event titled Treating Grief Through a Narrative Lens, Clinical Differentiation of Grief from Depression with Practical Bereavement Therapy Interventions. This webinar is a collaboration between the Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Social Workers and the Canadian Association of Social Workers. It is exciting to note that we have over 770 social workers from across Canada registered for today's event. Before I introduce our presenter, I just want to go over a few housekeeping details. This webinar presentation will be approximately 60 minutes, followed by a short question and answer period that I will moderate. Please note that the recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be available on the CASW website and on the NLASW website under continuing education in the next day or so. During the presentation, I encourage you to type in your questions at any time and I'll begin asking them at the end of the presentation. Only the presenter and I will see the questions. A certificate of attendance will be available at the end of the presentation. Simply click on the yellow rightmost icon at the bottom of this presentation window when the presentation is wrapping up. So now I want to introduce our speaker, Elizabeth Shepard Hewitt. Elizabeth is a clinical social worker three at Terrace Clinic, which is an outpatient adult mental health clinic with Eastern Health here in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Elizabeth has a Bachelor of Social Work and a Master of Social Work, both from Memorial University. For more than 25 years, she has been employed primarily as a clinical health care social worker with subspecialities of child and adolescent and adult mental health, nephrology, and rehabilitative medicine. Elizabeth is past co-chair of the Canadian Social Work Journal and also a past member of the NLASW Connecting Voices newsletter. And she's looking forward to the inclusion of her chapter, Differentiating Grief and Depression, in an upcoming Ruth Leach publication titled Techniques of Grief Therapy 3 in 2018. Elizabeth lives here in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador with her husband, who is also a social worker, and their two sons. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the, the mic over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Annette, and uh, welcome everybody to our webinar today. Before I begin, I want to just give a quick thank you to CASW and to NLASW for inviting me to be part of this webinar series. The presentation I'm about to give you is an expanded version of one that I delivered in the spring at Eastern Health Annual Research Symposium. Um, I received some feedback from some very uh, kind people that told me that the practical nature of it was very useful to them. So when I was preparing today's session, I uh, tried to do the same thing as well. I think. I always find sessions that I can take something home and apply it to practice that's uh, useful for me, and I hope it will be for you. So for the last 12 years of my career, I have worked with adults experiencing mental health crises. Many of them are depressed and anxious and traumatized and suicidal and grieving. And working in outpatient therapy, um, my clients are usually very desperate to feel better. Two years ago, I began questioning if my approach to working with this population was really best practice. And so I began researching, and I found some validation in the works of Dr. Robert Nehmeyer, who I'll be referencing. And he is a pretty prolific therapist and author in the field of bereavement therapy. I was fortunate to attend his advanced course in complicated grief and bereavement therapy in April of 2016. And the second part of this presentation is taken from these things. I hope you find them as practical as I have. While attending this training with Dr. I was really honored to be invited to contribute a chapter in his book. And so uh, that chapter is about understanding the difference between grief and depression and how to proceed with multiple clients. And that's exactly where I hope to share with you today, part one of our session. So let's begin. Okay. So as I said to you at a few moments ago, today's presentation will We'll discuss how to tell in your own practice between adaptive and complicated grief and depression. We're going to talk about um, multiple diagnoses and how to clinically address them. I'm also going to explore with you some therapeutic strategies for working with clients experiencing loss through the death of a loved one. And to be clear, this presentation is about grief, and, and while we all know that grief can apply to many different uh, stages of our lives, 
uh, this presentation is specific to grief through death. Uh, we're also going to be looking at a case example. It's illustrating the complexities of working with multiple diagnoses and a suggested formula for same. And we'll do that at the very end of the presentation. Okay. So you've just received a referral to see a new client. And one of the most challenging parts that we experience as clinicians is trying to figure out what the timeline might be in terms of go and what's the best way to approach it. When we have multiple diagnoses, it's very difficult to figure out where the key symptoms are coming from. As well, we know that many symptoms of adaptive coping and complicated grief and depression are very similar. The client is coming to us looking for some resolution of the symptoms, and our job as clinicians is to figure out which category the sadness and withdrawal and cheerfulness falls into. What exactly is the, is the root issue for this client? Well, if we look at what grief is, clinically speaking, it is a multifaceted response to loss, particularly the loss of someone or something that has died to which a bond or affection was formed. We all know what grief is because it touches us in, in every area of our own lives. For as long as there's been life, there's been death. And so we have a sense going into loss with a client of what exactly is involved. But there are some key variables that appear to impact the individual's experience of grief. And these uh, are important for you to have a look at in your practice. The first one is the quality of the relationship to the deceased. So if there was a strong attachment, uh, if there was some challenge in the relationship, those are all variables. If you're somebody that spent every single moment with your mother and then she's suddenly not there, obviously you're going to have a pretty significant loss. Uh, by the same token, if you are somebody that had an ongoing feud with a parent or a loved one and they suddenly die without resolution, that's certainly going to impact your response. The bereaved person's coping resources is, an also, is also another variable. So if you're a person who uh, doesn't have very good coping strategies before having a traumatic loss, um, that's going to be more challenging for you uh, in comparison to someone who has dealt with a lot of issues in the past and has proven to be quite resilient. The third variable is the nature and the context of the loss. So if this was a sudden death, uh, if this was a suicide, any of those variables will certainly mean that the client is having to deal with it very quickly and it may be very challenging. We're going to talk a little bit about two particular types of grieving in this presentation. And the first one is adaptive grieving or normal grieving. Because we have all been impacted by this, um, a lot of us have different ideas about what is the right way to grieve. And I don't think anybody intentionally tries to uh, advise uh, their client or their loved ones that they watch going through the grief that they're doing something right or wrong. Um, but we get, give messages and we receive messages all the same, whether that's purposeful. What is really important for everyone to remember is that we grieve in a way that is personally meaningful to us. It doesn't have to meet any societal expectations. Really all that matters is that it works for us and it doesn't hurt anyone else. Where we ask our clients to take a look, though, is if they feel stuck. And if they feel that there hasn't been change, then perhaps then it is time to reflect and to seek help. Adaptive grieving uh, involves moving forward throughout the grief, and the survivor gradually integrates the event story of the death into his or her life narrative while drawing attachment security from the backstory of a loving relationship with the deceased. For example, if you are somebody that lost your mom and your mom always wanted to go to Europe and she spent her whole life talking about Europe but then didn't get to go, you might then be able to internalize that as from watching my mother miss out on something that she wants, I don't want to do that in my own life. So that experience becomes part of your life. And you might then take that and it might broaden your own perspective in terms of saying, okay, I've always wanted to do this. I'm going to learn from what I've experienced through the loss of my mom, and I'm not going to put that on the back burner. Also uh, important to remember is that the process of grief is very individual. Um, untypical uh, course of bereavement, bereavement might last one to two years, um, but you can certainly have um, certain periods of time where things will be more challenging to deal with. But the typical um, timeline for an adaptive grief, as uh, Zizek says, is about one to two years. Now, in comparison, we have complicated grief 
And that occurs when something interferes with the learning that is the core process of healing. The result is feelings of being stuck in acute loss. There are some diagnostic features of complicated grief, and they include bereavement for at least six months, marked and persistent separation distress with intense feelings of loneliness, yearning for or preoccupation with the pe person who has died, and significant impairment in social, occupational, or family functioning. So these are quite different from what you see in a, in a normal or a healthy adaptation uh, for grief. We also see um, some other diagnostic features, and there's quite a lot of information there on your screen. But generally, you see at least five of the nine symptoms um, almost daily, and they can be quite dis uh, disabling. So that would include a diminished sense of self. People may say something like, it feels like a part of me has died. They may have difficulty accepting the loss intellectually and emotionally. There may be some uh, avoidance of the reminders of the reality of loss. There may be an inability to trust others or to feel that others understand where they're coming from. There may be some bitterness or anger over the death. There could be di a difficulty moving on, making new friends, developing new interests. There can be numbness, inability to feel, sensing that life or the future has no purpose or meaning, and feeling stunned, dazed, or shocked by the death. And these come from um, Nehemiah's book, which is adapted from Prigerson and Shear et al. And there's a bibliography at the end, and you can look up some of these readings yourself if you're interested. So what I did right now is I know that's a lot of information, and I think sometimes it's useful to, to view it in a chart. So here's a comparison of adaptive versus comparative gr uh, complicated grief. So um, in adaptive grief, you see that the client acknowledges the reality of death, whereas in complicated, they're not able to do that. They can't accept it, and they may avoid reminders of loss. In adaptive grief, the client is able to retain access to bittersweet emotions. And for that, you, you see a lot of times they can maybe tell a funny story about someone they lost, and they can have a little laugh, even though they're feeling really sad. But that's not possible, really, strictly speaking, with a complicated grief. They're very stuck in the pain, and it's just very difficult to access anything other than pain. In adaptive grief, the client is able to revise how they remember the deceased and the bond that they shared, whereas in complicated grief, the individual may be stuck in relationship issues and separation distress. And finally, they can dis uh, in adaptive grief, they can develop a story of the narrative of loss, and redefine life goals and roles, uh, whereas in complicated grief, they can be really fixated on the story of the death and they have a lot of self-blame. Major depression can occur within the context of bereavement in the same way that it can occur following any other significant life event, the loss of a job, relationship, or traumatic event. And I think this is a new idea that you can grieve and be depressed. Um, and certainly, I think we're, we're learning a lot more about grief. And um, with the new DSM-5 that I'm going to talk to you about, um, they're certainly embracing that within the diagnostic criteria. So it's, it's really important for you to know that your client can have both issues. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about clinical depression. And um, we call that oftentimes major depressive disorder, or MDD, or it's simply known as depression. It's a mental disorder characterized by at least two weeks of low mood that is present across most situations. It is often accompanied by low self-esteem, loss of interest in normally enjoyed activities, low energy, and pain without a clear cause. In the DSM-4, the earlier edition, clinicians were asked not to diagnose a major depressive episode within two months of death unless there were severe markers such as suicidal ideation, uh, significant change in functional impairment, psychosis, psychomotor retardation, and a sense of worthlessness. So they put that time frame there within two months that that really prevented a diagnosis of depression if you were grieving. When the new edition, the DSM-5, came out, they dropped that altogether. And they said, you know, you can certainly have that. It doesn't immunize you. Uh, just because you have grief doesn't say, well, you can't have depression as well. You can certainly have that just as easily. So that's really important for you to remember. Me and my flow charts. Here's another one. Um, how do we differentiate between grief and depression? Okay, so 
in uh, the clinical indicators of a typical grief on the left, you'll see that a client who's experiencing a typical grief may isolate but generally maintains emotional connection with others. That's really different in what you may see in a depression. You will see isolation if somebody experiencing depression, but people isolate for different reasons. They're doing so largely because they may feel that they are an outcast, they may feel they don't have any connection to others, and it is very much a cognitive response. As well, in, on the left as well, we see that uh, hope uh, that the grief will end or get better is something someone going through a typical grief. However, with major depression, you see that there is a sense of hopelessness often present, that the person just believes that they will never feel better. The depression will never. In a typical grief, you will see that the client maintains overall feelings of self-worth. The loss does not seem to affect, uh, affect self-esteem in any way, shape, or form. Whereas in major depression, it seems to be very cognitively based, and the client can experience low self-esteem and self-loathing. This part, as an aside, gets a little tricky. If you have somebody that's experiencing a grief that previously may have had some self-esteem issues, so you may want to just kind of check that out a little bit. As well, you can see guilt in both columns, So, um, but there's a, a bit of a different reason. For uh, the typical grief, guilt, if present, is focused on letting down the deceased person. For example, they might say, if I'd only taken them to the doctor sooner, if I'd only listened when they told me that they had that stomach ache. Uh, whereas in major depression, the guilt often is with regards to the cognitive piece, again, feelings of being worthless or useless to others or being a burden. For typical grief, you can see a loss of pressure, pleasure uh, in both columns there. So it's important to be really clear with your client. If they tell you that they don't like to do things anymore, you want to check out why. With depression, you can have what we call a pervasive anhedonia, which means you just don't want to do anything. And that's not your fault. That's part of the illness. Whereas in a typical grief, there may be a connection to the person that you lost. If you used to go to bingo with your mom every Sunday night and suddenly she's passed and you don't want to go to bingo, it may be because it's related to the connection you had with your mother at that event. And so the loss of pleasure is often related to uh, the actual death versus um, across the board in depression. Um, we all get a little bit nervous when we have a client that talks about wanting to kill themselves or not wanting to be alive. And I think it's really important to check into that. With depression, we can see chronic thoughts of not wanting to live because they just don't want to. It's too difficult to be alive. Whereas people that might say that who are experiencing a typical grief, it's because they want to be reunited with the lost loved one. If that lost loved one had not passed, they may not have that feeling. So it's about wanting to be with them versus wanting to. And that's a really important thing to double check on. In a typical grief, um, loved ones can, can oftentimes be very supportive and they are able to draw support from them. Whereas in a major depression, they can spend a lot of time with loved ones, but they don't tend to always feel that support. Not that their loved ones are doing anything wrong, they're just not able to receive. You can see ruminating in both columns there. And I guess ruminating is um, spinning thoughts, pervasive thoughts that are constantly going on in the person's head. Um, ruminating is related to the death for, for a typical grief response. For example, if I don't mean to go to the doctor sooner, that kind of thought, those spinning thoughts. Whereas in a major depression, you may see ruminating about the, the very much the cognitive piece, being a bad person, being a burden to others, thoughts that nothing good is going to happen. So they're ruminating, but for different reasons. So just double check on that. So if the distress appears to be primarily related to the depression, Stabilization of the pre-existing condition becomes the initial treatment of focus. And it's up to you to figure out which is the cause. And I've given you a few diagnostic tools to look at, and there's going to be some, some more as well. But what's really important is for you to sort of make that determination for yourself before you develop a treatment plan. Clients with symptoms of depression or a premorbid history of depression experiencing acute distress should be encouraged to follow up with their GP or their psychiatrist just to ensure that they are safe. 
You can do the, sa- the therapy, but really safety is paramount. The person has to be alive to benefit from therapy, putting it boldly. But it comes down to you have to make sure they're safe. This really rolls into um, somebody that I'm a big fan of, Maslow, and his hierarchy of needs I think is really relevant for working this population, this therapeutic challenge. And Maslow, of course, talked about the fact that we need to meet our basic needs before we can actualize and we can meet higher-end needs. And if you have a client that is struggling to get out of bed, struggling to eat, struggling to sleep, his basic needs are not being met. He's not, he or she is not going to get any value out of a therapy session with you until they are feeling uh, better able to grasp those higher-level uh, issues. So, um, for example, you know, suicidality uh, is going to be a challenge because they're not going to be able to process the concept of maintaining a deeper connection with a lost loved one in any way other than suicide. You can't talk to them about how do you may remain connected to them through therapy techniques. Uh, they're just not there. So it's about remembering that you have to start with the base things, and that is keeping the client safe. It's important to remember that just because a client has a comorbid diagnosis, you don't necessarily have to treat it before addressing the, geek, the grief. What you have to do is make sure that it's safe, they're safe. So if they have a premorbid diagnosis, uh, or even if it's a new one, and they are stable, and they are coping, and then you can move on and treat the grief. But I would really recommend that you continue to check in and make sure that the person feels that they're doing okay. And that's really important in terms of restoring that locus of control. You can say to your client, how do you feel like you're coping with the depression? We've talked about a lot of heavy things. This is triggering things. Is it difficult for you to cope right now? Do you feel it's under control? Has it made you more, uh, has the grief made it more difficult for you to be safe? And what you're doing then is you're aligning with the client and helping them to recognize this is not just about going to a therapy session. This is about managing their life. They feel in control and comfort. That's really critical. Treatment. So now what I'm going to do is just give you a couple of case scenarios. When we did this at the Health Science, I had people yell out, but of course, they're not doing that today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the scenario, and then I want you to think about it as you're reading it, and then we're going to go to the next screen, which is the answer. So in the first case scenario, we have Justin, who's 20 years old, and he's a College of the North Atlantic student. He's a post-secondary student here in in Newfoundland. This uh, student lives alone. Two months ago, his girlfriend was struck and killed by a car while crossing the street. Um, He hasn't been able to go to school since. He's just having trouble concentrating. He's lying awake, thinking about his girlfriend, and really feeling some regret that he hadn't given her a ride to the store that evening. He was struck. He's talking about having some suicidal thoughts and wanting to be with Chelsea. But in the last two weeks, we're noticing that he's having a little bit of an easier time. He's gotten together with some friends, and he met with a school guidance counselor. So this one is an example of adaptive grief. Nobody is saying that adaptive grief is easy, because it isn't. But we see that there's movement going on, and just, Justin seems to be improving. While the death was shock, uh, was a shock, and he blames himself, there doesn't appear to be any direct impact on anything cognitive, uh, so self-esteem or identity, and those would be the indicators in particular that would suggest it's a Case scenario number two. Marla is a 56-year-old married mother of two children. Two years ago, her brother Sam was killed overseas while on vacation. Since his death, she reports an inability to return to work and struggles to complete her ADLs, activities of daily living, which has isolated, uh, and she's also isolated herself from friends and family. She reports there's nothing to get out of bed for. She cries daily and reports being unable to look after look at herself in the mirror because she is disgusted by what she sees. She recently had an overdose of a bottle of pills, and she was found quite accidentally by a friend. She reports hating her life and that she feels that she's a burden to everyone. She feels there's no escape from hell and she wants to. So this is a really uh, clear diagnosis of depression. And she's actively grieving the loss, but there isn't any yearning for uh, to be reunited with her brother. Her physical safety is in jeopardy because she's already had a suicide attempt. Her symptoms also appear to be identity and sort of cognitively based. And that would also support the diagnosis of a depression. The primary issue to treat in this scenario would be stabilizing the depression. And then once we get past that, 
we can look at moving on to the bereavement. In case scenario three, we have Shelly, who's 26 years old, and she got married last month to Mark. Shelly lost her father to cancer two years ago, and she's talking about really missing her dad. As a teen, she had some issues with concentration in school, and she had some low energy and difficulty sleeping with some low self-esteem. And while there's been some change and improvement in those symptoms, there's a lot that's remained the same. She continues to struggle with getting up in the morning, and she doesn't have any interest in being with friends or family or doing any activities that she usually enjoys. While she believes that Mark feels that she's beautiful, she does not. She feels ugly. ugly. And she has never told her doctor how she feels. She just wants to be happy, but she can't remember the last time she's felt that way. Shelly may um, have an undiagnosed or, or untreated depression. So it's, it's probably a combination of depression and grief. And now the additional burden of loss may have just kind of tipped the scales and made things a little bit too complicated for her to deal with. In this scenario, it would be valuable to have a conversation with Shelly to talk to her about some common symptoms of depressed and help her to develop some mood stability all while normalizing the grief response. If Shelly feels safe and able to move on to treating grief, you could proceed. But be mindful that the treatment uh, should also include checking in with depression and making sure that she is safe. Case scenario four. Donna is a 48-year-old single woman. Nine months ago, her identical twin sister died following a diagnosis of breast cancer. Donna feels unable to move through her grief, stating that it is now as raw as it was the first day. She's been, she has been able to remain working, but she's finding um, enjoy, difficulty to have enjoyment in anything that she's doing. She has fleeting thoughts of suicide and talks to her sister every day. And that's the deceased sister. <laughs> her apartment is filled with photos of the two together and her sister's belongings. She hopes that the grief will lessen, but she's worried that it won't. This is a good example of complicated grief and depression. Uh, and it's complex because the depression is creating thoughts of suicide and a lack of enjoyment in daily living. The key point here is feeling that the grief has not changed in six months. There's no movement. The client is stuck. Talking to her sister is fine, but it's, and it's not a variable unless she's hallucinating. So you want to check that out. Uh, maintaining a connection post-death is encouraged in bereavement therapy. Um, so the plan would be to stabilize the depression, ensure the safety, and then move on to bereavement. So some things to keep in mind. If a client is suicidal because they want to join a deceased loved one in heaven, look instead of finding reconnection in life versus in death. This feeling is not the same as thoughts because they want to be together, not stopping living. When a person seems stuck in protracted grief or distress, um, famous therapist Therese Rando, she suggests just asking a simple question. Is it okay for you to be okay? This can reveal the client's uh, reasons for resisting change, such as not feeling that um, you know, being a good mother means that you can feel happy after your child. And so those are the obstacles that you may have to deal with before you can even do treatment therapy. So again, if the distress appears to be the primary reason for the disability, you need to start with stabilization before you can start anything else. Clients with symptoms of depression uh, should be involved with uh, their medical team, especially if they are feeling overwhelmed by the loss and they feel unsafe. Um, so again, it's about you doing the therapy, but you have to make sure you So the next step is figure it out exactly what's going on. You know what's presenting issue is. You've hopefully stabilized any depression that might be present. Next thing you do is you go on to treat the grief. And so the, the techniques in this webinar are ones that I have taken from um, the advanced practice course that I did with Dr. Naaman. And so I found them to be really, really useful. I'm hoping that you will be as well. So again, these, these come directly from uh, Dr. Robert Neymar. I encourage you, if you have an opportunity to, to uh, read any of his work or to go see him in person and you're interested in this area, by all means do so. Um, on this slide, I just have a little bit of information about him. So he is based out of the University of Memphis in Tennessee. He has lots of books that he has published including uh, two in the series earlier, uh, Techniques of Grief Therapy, 
um, those are the two ones that I've referenced quite a bit in this presentation, and I'm going to be in the third one, hopefully. Um, he's published near the, nearly about 500 articles and book chapters, and his mission is to advance a more adequate theory of grieving as meaning-making process. He's gotten a lot of international awards, and he is um, a pretty prolific presenter as well. So that's who he is. There's a lot of really interesting people in, that are experts in this area, but I, uh, I very much enjoy him. So I came out of here. Okay. So you know from the earlier parts of this presentation, we know what the presenting issues are, that the person may be stuck, the person may be identifying certain issues that they want to work. So now it's time for you to clarify. So the first thing you're going to do is you're just going to ask them a very direct question. Ask them how they feel they are doing with their grieving. Seems pretty pretty easy, isn't it? And you know, I think a lot of clients will have a very easy time doing that. You may also want to ask for a symptom snap. What would I have seen or heard if I met you three months ago compared to meeting you today? And this is good because it tells you if they are stuck or not. Um, if there has been some adaptation to loss and improvement of symptoms, then you know that they are moving through the grief. And that gives you a good indication that perhaps it is not complicated grief. You want to also investigate integration. As you ask the client to tell you the story of their death, you want to pay attention to some blocking or signs of incongruence between the verbal and the nonverbal that might suggest avoidant coping. And we know that, again, with avoidant coping, that is an indicator of complicated you also want to make sure that you convey interest in the hardest parts of the story. What is the most painful part of this experience for you? What are the parts of this story that others rarely hear? That alone can give you your direction in terms of where you want to. If there are more difficult parts of the story, maybe that's where your goals are going to be. Again, you'd work on that one. This one is an easy one for all of us. Use open-ended questions. What can you tell me about what this loss means to you? How would you describe your feelings since this loss on an average day? Do you see this changing over time? How? You will also want to consider the impact this loss has had on the survivor's worldview. For example, has this loss changed the way you think about life, about yourself, about your future? You will want to evaluate the impact of the loss on the social world. For example, how has this affected your relationships with other people? What concerns do others have about you? That last question is particularly useful because there you may hear a different dimension of what's going on. You might hear something like, my mother uh, thinks I should get out of bed more often. And maybe they wouldn't disclose that they're in bed every day, but through their mother's eyes they can tell you that. Quite a useful question. You've asked all those clarifying questions. What do I do next? Well, once you understand what the treatment needs are, then you can begin. There are an awful lot of techniques for grief therapy, and there isn't a right or wrong approach. Really what it comes down to is your comfort level as a clinician to use them and the suitability for your client depending on what their needs are. The main difference in treating both types of complicated or, ad or adaptive grief is recognizing that it can be more challenging for the individual experiencing complicated grief. And there can be some subconscious reasons for being stuck that you will have to explain. There are an awful lot of uh, grief therapy techniques that I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. Um, many of them come from the books that I have referenced in the end, which is Techniques of Grief Therapy, uh, again by Dr. He is the editor, Dr. Robert Neen. Robert A. Nehmeyer, and there's two volumes of that, and they're excellent books because they are about a page and a half uh, per technique. It tells you the type of client that's most suited to that, and it gives you very uh, a case example and some very clear directions. So it's extremely useful. And so some of these that I'm going to talk to you about there come from those books and from the uh, course that I did. Uh, as well, I want to just mention that I do a lot of these myself, and I find them to be extremely useful. Um, okay, so let's get into what they are. The first one is called Retelling the Narrative of Death, Restorative Retelling. Now, I don't know about you, but I know every client that I've ever seen that has come to me in grief, they want to tell me what happened. They want to tell me 
how their loved one passed away. And this is a therapeutic approach to storytelling. Especially helpful for violent deaths such as suicide, and it is grief facilitation related to PTSD exposure treatments. It really encourages the retelling of the story or the narrative of loss slowly in very, very uh, small detail from three different perspectives. And so you wouldn't in engage in all three of these perspectives in the same therapy session, but you might take one, of the, one therapy uh, approach, and you can do that for several sessions, and then you may want to go to the next one and the next one after that. So the first one is the external narrative. And this is the objective story, the facts. It's highly sensory. It's the external story. For example, the smell of blood when you walked into the room and you saw your loved one. The second one is the internal narrative. That is the emotion-focused story. And that is the client's own perspective, how they are feeling at every moment as they take this inch-by-inch inch step through the story. At every moment, how are you feeling? What were you thinking? Of? What was your perspective at that time? And the third one is the reflexive narrative, what you imagine others were feeling at that moment, the other people at the scene, the ambulance attendant, um, your friend that was there, um, your husband, your, your son, anybody. Uh, and all together, you take these each individual strands of the narrative, you weave them together, and you come up with this very comprehensive, stronger narrative, kind of like a braid. And it, this thickening... Uh, is very useful for the client. Kathy Shear is a medical doctor in New York City, and she's quite a prolific um, trainer and therapist herself. She has a, a complicated grief therapy approach that she uses this model with, and the goal is to begin to foster revision of the mental image of the deceased and the integration to the story of loss. And the idea is that retelling the story lessens the emotional arousal, and it increases client wholeness. So we're trying to help the person rebuild from the, the trauma that they've endured. And using this approach, you can negotiate with the client. You can decide in advance how you're going to do it. At what point in the story will you begin? Will you, be, will you begin when you got the call, when you walked in the room? Um, you'll determine how long it's for. How long will you be talking about this in the story? you do it for 10 minutes? Will you do it for 15 minutes? And these are things that you would negotiate with. As you begin to do that retelling of the client, there are some things that will make it more meaningful for them. And we call that bracing, pacing, and facing. So bracing, uh, within, the within the session, you, the client will uh, around. You may say something to them like, hold that image of finding your son in your mind for just a moment and bring and when you're ready to talk about it, we will move on. So you're preparing them to move. You're reminding them that they're not there, present in that moment and that they are safe. Pacing, as you tell the story and you're inching along extremely slowly, you might break the story into chapters. And you may discuss with your client how much you're going to do in that session. Um, and so the therapist can guide the retelling, and they may say, okay, we're going to do it for 10 to 15 minutes, um, starting at what point. And they can, you can cue them to close their eyes, or they may have photos that they want to look at that's, that reminds them of the different things. Facing. Facilitation of the client becoming a witness to the trauma in an emotionally safe way. This is a little trickier. And what this is uh, could include imagining themselves present at the time what happened, imagining themselves comforting the loved one. And this approach installs a more emotionally healthy image into the vine. So that can be very useful. Throughout this whole process, the client should be sure to debrief the client and encouraging them to have some self-appreciation as they do it. For example, encouraging them to feel that that was difficult, but they were successful in doing so, despite how hard it was. You want to encourage the client to have that reappraisal. Um, I hadn't thought about it that way, but, you know, I do feel that way. I didn't realize I was still feeling that way. Um, and you also want to encourage them to, to do things like setting the story aside later for revisiting. Um, we don't have to be present in our every minute of every day. Um, and I don't have to think about it anymore. 
that's okay. I've done a lot of work. Another thing that we do a lot of work about social work, and I'm sure other do the job, is we talk to our clients. A lot. Um, I want to talk to you about some very specific journaling techniques that, you can use. and they can include event narratives, personal journals, biographies and eulogies, musical memoirs, and correspondence with others. Talk to you about some of them. Throughout the journaling, we do give you a few different guidelines, and the literature will suggest that you focus on a difficult experience of death or loss. Um, ignore the grammatical structure and spelling. Stream of consciousness is what I usually tell. You. Um, journal a minimum of 20 minutes per day, at least three times a week. You want to make sure that your client and they can decide how that's going to be. For example, they may say that uh, when this uh, loved one is in the, is present, so if they get overwhelmed, they can go get support from them. And we want them to plan a post-writing activity because, again, they need to have that recovery stage after doing so. We also want to remember that the client is not going to be able to write about the benefits of loss in an early stage of grief. They're just not ready for that at this point. Um, you also want to consider a setting that the client might feel comfortable in. And again, this is something that you, you should negotiate with them and have them to think about. Discuss time of day, day of week. Um, would they want to put on a timer to make sure it's 20 minutes? What will they do after the writing? Are there traditional things needed after the writing so that, that, they, that they can do before they do the next thing? And again, you want to make sure that they have that emotion. We talk about 20 minutes because the body's stress response dissipates over 15 minutes. And if the client is able to stay with it beyond that 15 minutes, then they're going to learn that they can cope with intense emotion, which is exactly what they need to learn. Um, and recognizing that they can cope with difficult feelings is called self-immersion. And Dr. Nehmeyer reports that it's actually found to be half as effective as formal psychotherapy, which we don't want to get out to our clients because we don't want to be jobless. Um, so in terms of directed writing, some guidelines for sense making, and this is taken from uh, a piece by uh, and um, some things that we want to encourage is sometimes we may want to give them some questions uh, if they're struggling with how they're going to deal. And so on the slide, I've given you some different ones that he recommends. And so you don't have to give them any of these things, but if they're looking for some direction, you might suggest including something like, how did you make sense of the loss at the time? Now, what spiritual or philosophical beliefs contributed to your coping, and how did they change in turn? Have you found any unsought gifts in the grief? And if so, what? And again, as a disclaimer, please not for the early stages of grief, they're not there. Uh, as well, how has this experience exper uh, affected your priorities? What qualities do you feel contribute to your own resilience? And how has this transition deepened your gratitude for what you have been given? Again, there's a lot of uh, asking the client to be effective and reflective, and that can be very comforting. I certainly have had the experience where I've had clients show up with an exercise book full of journals. For them, they said, Elizabeth, I want you to read these 50 pages that I wrote last night. And if I was going to read the 50 pages, I probably wouldn't get to any of the therapy. So uh, that's a bit of a struggle because they're so earnest and they're so excited and proud of themselves. So I'm sure I'm not the only one that's dealt with that. And so some suggestions for, for those kind of situations is you can ask them which part is most meaningful to them, and you can have them read it to you. Sometimes they can't choose because it's all like terribly important, and, and it may very well be. So what you might want to do is invite them to close their eyes and visualize the pages turning until they stop where it's most meaningful. You can also read it to them, and that gives them the ability to reflect and bear witness upon their own life. You can take breaks, and you can say, okay, what were you thinking when you wrote this? What were you feeling? And you can have them reflect on what that significance of the passage was. So it can be a very useful therapeutic tool. Another example of a strategy you can use that involves writing, which is quite a different one, and I hadn't heard of this before I went to the course, is called Chapters of Our Lives and uh, the value of autobiography. And so in this approach, we would ask the client to imagine their life as a book. And then you would encourage them to write a table of contents detailing the different significant stages of their life. 
And you might ask them, what would the title of the first chapter be? Um, obviously, we don't tend to think of our lives as books, so that takes a few minutes to get your head around it. So you might give them about 10 minutes and ask them to write chapter titles uh, for their life story. And then once they're able to do that, you might then look at it with the client. And it can be quite interesting for the client and also for you as a therapist. You might choose some facilitative questions to ask, and there's lots of different types. And again, you don't have to do all these, but these are some things that you might consider. There are some organizational questions. Um, for example, how did you organize the flow of your self-narrative? Did you do it by chronology or was it another way? And when did you begin the narrative? At birth or at some other developmental stage? And could you write a forward to discuss the parents, uh, how your parents impacted where you were? When did you end your self-narrative? Did you stop where you are right now or did you go into 50 years from now when you think you might be past? Uh, how would it look if you were about to project ahead with future titles? There are some developmental questions as well. Um, as you look back on how your story has developed over time, does the change seem to be more gradual, sudden? How did you decide when one chapter ended and the next one began? So again, you're really asking the client to take a good look at what's going on with them, really to be able to make some sense. There may be some thematic questions. Looking at your story, what are the major themes that tie it all together? Did major life events impact the patterns? Did you notice any minor themes that might pull you in a different there's some authorship, authorship questions as well. Who do you seem as, see as the primary author of it? Are you writing it as yourself or from a different point of view? Are there important co-authors who deserve the credit or the blame for the way that the story has unfolded? And how might those chapters look different if you wrote them from the person you were 10 years ago or the person that you will be 10 years ago? So again, you can be quite creative in this approach. There may also be audience questions in terms of who would be the most relevant audience for the self-narrative, who would enjoy the way that it's written, and who would want to edit it. We all have critical people in our lives. I'll certainly tell you something there. Are there silent stories in your life that cannot be told? And how would things be different? if? As well, there's framing questions. You could give your self-narrative title, what would it be? And what would the pictures look like? Drama, is it a comedy? Is it history? Is it mystery? Is it romance? And, or would it be a lot of short stories? So it's a, it's a very creative application. And you may have people who are quite uh, creative in the way that they deliver the, their life anyway, and so they might be really on board with doing that. The next one is playing with playlists. And I tend to be more musically focused, so I, I really enjoy this one. And this is narrative storytelling using music. And so what you might do is you might ask the client, what was your loved one's favorite pieces of music? Um, when did they experience these together? What do you miss about those times? And if you were to create a movie about your loss, what would the soundtrack be? You can invite the client to play music from their iPhone that tells different facets of her story and to create a personal playlist. You can encourage that client to place those songs in a sequence that holds special meaning. For example, they're telling a story from the time they met, different challenges in their relationship, and to the connection past loss. And sometimes you can do it as an intergenerational. If you have a, like a senior who's not really overly tech savvy, they might partner with a grandchild or a, or a sibling or somebody that might be, and they can create a music video to tell their story. And so based on this, we can look at a lot of different things. We can ask them to reconstruct meaning. We can say, you know, what does that hearing that music from the past mean to you today? Are there lyrics that don't fit anymore? What words or songs would you change? What would you want someone else to understand? About? Who do you trust with your story? You might also ask them if they could sing a song or play a music video for their loved one right now. Which one would it be? And if they could play one for you, what would they play? And so this approach is, again, quite creative and can be very soothing. The client might develop a playlist that they can play at certain times when they want to feel more connected. Because if they worry that they're losing a connection, playing that music might be very soothing. It also can facilitate an opportunity to have a good cry and a, and a, and a structured opportunity to do that. 
um, back to writing once, correspondence with the deceased. Now, Dr. Neymar talks about this one. And a lot of times, you know, we all hear about writing a letter of goodbye, but this one um, is a little bit different, and it uses the narrative uh, strategy that Michael White talked about in terms of hello again rather than a final goodbye. In this approach, the client is asked to really speak deeply from the heart about something that's really important in the relationship. You're encouraging them to consider what the other person has given, intentionally or not, of enduring value. And they're going to address the words that remain unspoken and the questions that were And so some possible things that you may want to give your client as they're, as they're writing a letter to somebody that's passed, you may want to start with, what I've always wanted to tell you is, what you never understood was, what I want you to know about me is, what I now realize is. The one question I've always wanted to ask is, or I want to keep you in my life, by. These are all very um, powerful statements. And they may be an opportunity to unlock some other pieces that are not accessible. One of the biggest challenges is maintaining that loss, uh, maintaining that connection through loss. Um, and this is a great way to do that because you're encouraging them to write a letter to somebody that they love. Um, what we want to do is we want to reconstruct that bond instead of relinquishing it. Um, and there was a great story that uh, Dr. Niemeyer told us in the, in the course, and that was about this 82-year-old widower named Tom who had lost his best friend, his wife of, year, of 60 years, Margaret. And they'd spent some all of their lives together sharing the details of their life. And he really encouraged Tom to write Margaret a letter to share those details now and what his feelings of loss were. And so Tom wrote that, and he found it really useful, And but he was still very sad. And then and Bob said to him, well, you know what, I think maybe what we'll get you to do now is I want you to write a response from Margaret. We want Margaret to write you a letter in return. So she's received your letter, and what would she say to you? And it was quite powerful because he was able to write a letter that said, now, Tom, you know I worry about you when you don't do this, and, and it wasn't your fault that I died, and, and that kind of thing, which was exceptionally healing for him. Um, and he wrote both letters, but in his mind, he was writing one from his wife. And it really helped him to get through a very difficult state. So it's a, it's a creative application to writing a letter, but one that's extremely useful. This next one here is one that I think I've been doing since I was an undergrad, and I'm sure probably many of you have as well, and that's the chair work and imaginal conversations. Um, you can apply this to any type of work and not just grief work. Um, and basically what you're doing is you're asking the client to imagine that a loved one is sitting there in a vacant chair, and what would that person say if they were with you today? Uh, if your mother was in the chair, would she have agreed that her death was your fault? Would she have offered another explanation for her passing? That kind of thing. And this commonly involves enactment of a dialogue between the person that's imagined to be in the chair and the griever playing both roles. And this approach reaffirms that continuing bond, providing a sense of attachment security. Um, and yeah, so it, it can facilitate resolution of concerns about the death of relationship, such as survivor guilt or self-blame. It's quite, quite intense. The last skill that I want to talk to you about today is called the Life Certificate. And this is something that I got from the Dulwich um, Center's website, because I tend to be more narrative in my approach. And this is a great little tool that a narrative social worker based out of Hong Kong by the name of Mohammed Fariz developed. And it's an opportunity for you to discuss with your client the other components of the lost loved one's story, separate from the narrative of loss. Um, you can see on this screen, this is something that I just put together, but you can make it look anything you want. And it's a collection of different pieces uh, reference to the life and the, that you shared with this person in the past. And so that might include the name of the deceased, photograph or a drawing of the deceased, um, some information about them, their favorite hobby, things that they used to say a lot that you don't want to forget, what you appreciated about this client, about this person that has passed, what this person appreciated about the client, um, gifts that the client has received from the person, and gifts that they want to pass on. And by gifts, I mean life lessons, values, skills, perspectives, hopes, dreams, any of that stuff that's meaningful to them. And then the last part is how I can take care of myself when I miss this person too much. 
um, life certificates enable us to explore with the client other types of memories and thoughts about the deceased person rather than just being stuck in the pain and the suffering that comes with loss. There are three sets of inquiry, and the first two were developed by uh, the incomparable Michael White. And the first section is really about understanding the contributions that the deceased person made and exploration of the client's identity through the eyes of the deceased individual. And so that could include what you love or appreciate about the deceased, what are some of the gifts that have been given to you, what are some of the memories that remind you of what you appreciate, um, what would they say about the person you are, and what advice would the deceased person have. The second set involves further investigation of how the client has contributed to the life of the deceased and the specific details of how this has shaped the deceased person, perception of the client that they are. So you're looking through the deceased person's eyes. How would this person appreciate you? What might the deceased say about you that contributed to his life? And what do you think that this contribution made a difference in terms of how they saw his own life? The third set of responses is focuses on the responses to the pain that have been useful. For example, what do you do when memories and thoughts become too painful? What does this pain tell you about what you value the most? And what has been useful in pushing the pain away? Are there certain memories that you visit that have given you comfort? And who has been helpful in helping you deal with the pain? So this tool, and there's a, as there's a lovely little video online, there's a link that I've posted there from the Dulwich Center in Australia. And uh, Mohammed talks about how he developed that himself. I would encourage you, if you're interested in learning more about it and developing your own, by all means, go check that one out. So in this webinar, we've talked about how to tell the difference between the two types of grief and depression. We've talked about how to determine treatment goals. And we've also talked about some clinical strategies to treat the grief. Now let's put it together in a typical case. I want to give you a, a case study. And this was a case that I had many, many years ago. Uh, and I've changed all the identifying information. But the story, essentially, is I had a client by the name of Sarah who was 45 years old. She had two young stepchildren. Um, her doctor told her she had major depressive for about 10 years, and she had been had her, sit, her symptoms treated pretty successfully with medication until three months before she presented at our clinic. She had been adopted as an infant, and she grew up feeling like an outsider because she was really different from her, the rest of her family, and she was worried that her parents regretted adopting her. She says that her dad was pretty critical, and she just never felt like she could please him. Nine months before she came to our clinic, her, doctor, her father became quite sick, and he ended up in the hospital. They didn't feel that the illness was serious, but unexpectedly he passed away one evening while Sarah was alone with him. The last words that he said to her were very critical. While she was very sad at the loss of her father, she was able to go back to work, and she did pretty well for six months. And then suddenly, she couldn't get out of bed. She cried all the time, she was irritable, she wanted to be alone, and she super angry. She went to her doctor and they took her off work at, from her job as a secretary. And despite trying to change her medication, she just didn't feel better. After three months of not feeling good, uh, her doctor said that she needed to refer to our mental health clinic for an evaluation for medication to make sure that we, she understood what was going on uh, from, a, from a diagnostic clarification. The psychiatry got involved and they did a very thorough assessment. And they said that Sarah had major depressive disorder with anxious distress and symptoms of bereavement. They adjusted her medication. They suggested that she do more things functionally with some behavioral activation. And they sent her to me to treat the depression and the grief. This is the point when I would ask you how you would help this client. I'm sure she doesn't sound very different from a lot of the people that you see in practice. And it's about understanding what the primary issue is. Is her primary issue grief or depression? In this determination, we decided that the, pr the primary issue was depression because she was quite incapacitated and it was having some cognitive issue. We talked about it uh, being a, a complicated grief because even though she had been able to do some things, she hadn't progressed in dealing with the law. Are there other issues impacting her? By all means, there certainly were. There was a pretty traumatic history um, of dealing with uh, family of origin issues, and they were really impeding on her ability to get through this. I want to read you a little bit from what I did with her. Um, 
Upon assessment, I determined Sarah's primary goals of symptoms to be depression related to the pervasive cognitive component and her profound worthlessness. She also expressed active suicidal ideation and felt she had nothing to offer to anyone in her family, being a burden to all. She exhibited classic depression symptoms, including sleep disturbances, irritability, lack of interest in previously enjoyed activities, feelings of alienation, loss of appetite, and challenges in maintaining activities of daily living, and just getting out of bed. While grief was the catalyst for her mood decline, it appeared to overtax her coping strategies that she'd been using quite successfully for 10 years. She reported that her current symptoms were similar to a previous relapse she'd had eight years before that had nothing to do with loss. We agreed on a treatment approach that included initially addressing the depression to free up emotional energy to address the loss. Sarah reported having a clear treatment plan helped her to feel an increase in control. Initial steps addressed Sarah's sense of, sense of worthless, of powerlessness, in the feeling of such a life upheaval. She described feeling as if she was in a deep hole and she could not escape. She was very responsive to the narrative approach and came to view her symptoms um, as manifestations of the illness. These symptoms were viewed as ways that the illness could facilitate its objective of taking away her personal power and creating hopelessness. By the end of her first session, Sarah talked about feeling hope at the knowledge that she could resist the illness and be able to mobilize resilience. I saw her in therapy every two weeks for about three months, and eventually she began to skillfully identify which thoughts were hers and which were part of the illness. By challenging the negative thoughts, she began to feel more in control, and the medication assisted in her increased energy, which she redirected into fighting depression and returning to work. Despite this progress, the anger and the sadness remained, and it was now time to address her grief. Sarah reported that the grief became more tangible when her depression was better managed and she was able to return to activities daily living, of daily living and work. She was better able to determine where her depression ended and her grief began at that point, and then she realized the grief was pretty substantial. In therapy, she began to realize that the anger she had thought to be a symptom of depression was still present. She soon recognized that she was still angry that her father had been critical and that despite working hard to please him, it was never enough. With anger came tremendous guilt. How could she be angry with someone she loved who had died? Interestingly, before the stabilization of the depression, she did not even realize she had anger towards her father. It was only once she started to address the grief that this emerged. Unable to confront her dad directly, I encouraged her to journal. We discussed writing a letter to him, communicating her inner conflict and her unresolved anger. We discussed over many sessions what Sarah might do in the letter and finally decided on the use of ceremony. Sarah would read the letter aloud in her backyard at the fire pit with her supportive husband present, and once done, she would burn it, symbolizing the release from the despair, anger, and pain. She struggled to write her letter until one day she was ready. She took a notebook to a city park and wrote, quickly wrote 10 pages. That evening, she read her, loud, her letter aloud to her father, crying, yelling, and releasing words she had never shared until that morning. Then she burned the letter as planned in the fall. She described the feeling of freedom from pain, anger, and despair as she watched it burn and a peace that wrapped around her like a blanket. The next morning, Sarah and her husband dug out the ashes from the letter and, in a gesture of love, carefully placed them around a large oak tree that grew in her garden, her father's favorite tree. Sarah came to see me for the next session a week after the ceremony, and the change in her was dramatic. She looked 10 years younger, and as she described the ceremony, smiled for the first time that I, we, since I'd seen her six months before. While still grieving the loss of her father, she reported feeling better able to manage the simplicity of loss without the complications of anger. We met for two further sessions, exploring the pain of loss with strategies to remain connected to her dad since the A year later, I happened upon Sarah in the hospital parking lot, and she shared with me her delight at her success in moving through the pain of loss feeling more connected to her husband and stepchildren, garnering a promotion out. She had found her way out of the So in that example, I wanted to share with you how important it is to deal with the different layers that come with a complicated situation like that. Um, that's a case that I think I'm always going to remember because it was so dramatic, and they're not always dramatic like that. 
but it's, an, it's a good illustration that using um, an interesting combination of things to work for the client can certainly help them mobilize through the really complicated reachings of grief and if any of you is interested in learning more about this topic, I really would recommend the Techniques of Grief Therapy Volumes 1 for some further ideas and skills and strategies. And certainly look up Dr. Nimai and Kathy Shear. They have lots of training opportunities. So in summary, there are loads of uh, approaches to bereavement therapy, and I'm certainly not saying that I'm an expert in this area, but I wanted to share with you today the fact that you know, I've learned some great things that I find really useful in my practice, and I really hope that they've been useful for you too. If you have any questions, or certainly I'll questions, and I have an email address there as well you can use. So in summary, not everyone will understand. Not their journey. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for this wonderful presentation. Excellent clinical and practical information for everyone who's online here today. So we have arrived at our question and answer uh, section, and we're going to do our best to, to get through some of the questions in the time that we have left. Um, so I'll just start, Elizabeth, and uh, ask the question and hand it over to you. Uh, someone had a question about the life certificate and what will be the timing of doing the life certificate with a client in their grieving process? When is a good time to start it and is there a possibility of doing it too early in the loss? Okay, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure I can tell you that definitively. I think it's really going to be quite individually based. Um, I've certainly done it with people at different stages in their grieving and they will let you know if it's too uh, sometimes people just really need to sit with the loss and they're not ready to think about the other components. But sometimes the idea will really uh, be something that they're drawn to. Um, <clears throat> you can certainly negotiate what topics you put on there as well. The idea of the certificate is uh, just an opportunity to think about loss within a different framework so they're not just thinking about the negative component, that they're surrounded by the, the love and the support and the positivity of that person brought to their life. So I don't know that there's a there's a clear answer on that. I'm sorry I'm not more helpful, but I think what I would do is I would bring it to the client and say, hey, I just learned about this great thing. Um, I thought maybe it might be useful. What do you think? And they'll let you know pretty clearly if it's too early. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, another question from an online participant is, how do you mitigate the risk of re-traumatization in the process of inviting the narrative in cases of traumatic grief? And that's another important question. I think that's where you have to set the, the safety net, and we talk a lot about when we're going through retelling of the story, you need to make sure that they know that they're safe. You're going to do a lot of prep work in terms of making sure that they're grounded. And a lot of the stuff that you do do in trauma therapy, you want to make sure that set the parameters in terms of how long you talk about it, where they're comfortable starting, and, and that is always a variable that you can re-traumatize. I think when a client comes to you and they tell their story, though, they're interested in, t in telling their story, and certainly they may not have done it in a very therapeutic way, but they want to tell their story, and they've probably told their story many, many times before they've gotten to you. So I think it's about one of those things you always have to be mindful of, and you can engage the client in saying, you know what, if this is too much, I need you to tell me. And I think that's really important that they recognize that even though you're the therapist in the situation, you've got Excellent. Um, someone else had asked for uh, if you could give an example of facing and a therapist's role in that. Okay, I'll go back to that slide. We'll put that on a net. <laughs> okay, so facing, so that's when they are. All right, maybe we can get back to that one while I look. So I'll look for a slide. How's that? Um, do you think some of these techniques would work well with people who've experienced ambiguous losses? So, for example, losses that, where the person may not be deceased but is missing, for example. Oh, absolutely. I think that um, we talk about it as a finality. Thank you. Uh, I think that... Um, I think what it is is that loss is loss, absolutely. And you can use this in any way that you think might be most appropriate. Um, 
if if something if somebody's lost uh, or just you don't know who they are, it certainly is there is a finality there that is always going to be present. You can certainly do that. You can still write a letter to somebody that's lost. You can do a lot of different things. Um, and so um, I think it's just a bit the creative application. And that's what I really like about um, the narrative approaches is because you can tailor them to whatever makes most sense to you, right? So absolutely, you can use this in any way that makes sense, that's meaningful to um, your client. Hey, thank you. Um, what is your best advice for social workers who are working with clients as case managers where grief is only one of the uh, issues that the client may be dealing with? And I was worried I wasn't going to get any questions today. These are excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, okay. So I think it's going to come down to what the role of the case manager is. I certainly can't speak to what everybody's role is. I know in our clinic we have a case manager. And they may not be doing the um, in-depth therapy, but certainly if you are, as the case manager, doing the in-depth therapy, um, then your role is pretty clear. If you're in a supportive role and you're not the one doing the primary therapy, then I think maybe what you may want to do is you may want to work with the, the other members of the, of the team and sort of delineate who's going to do what. I think there's a role for everybody in this. Um, I think for a lot of these things, like, for example, the retelling of the narrative of death, no, no matter who you are on a, th on a treatment team, you are probably going to hear the story because they're, they're going to tell you and people are going to meet you and they're going to say, so I lost my mom last week and this is what happened and they're going to tell you. So if you're not in a therapy role where you, know, you have some different goals that you're working on with them, you're probably not going to want to do this because you're, it's going to get in the way of doing the other things. You're going to want to be respectful of the story at the same time. I think it's going to be something that you have to work out with the client and say, hey, we can talk about this today, but we probably won't have time to do anything else. Is that what's going to be meaningful to you in this session? Hey, um, do we want to go back to the uh, question now on facing? And the question again was, could you give an example of facing and the therapist's role in that? i got to be honest, that's a tough one but uh, I'm going to give it my best shot. I haven't personally done this one, but I have had a client that had a very traumatic experience where they walked in and they found their loved one had suicided. And so she talked about picking up little pieces of her deceased son uh, because she didn't want the ambulance people to do that and how traumatic that was for her. And so one of the ways that we could use that approach would be to imagine that she was there with him, cradling him, um, comforting him uh, as he drew his last breath so that he was not alone. Imagine herself there holding him in her arms, telling him how much she loved him, that she would never leave him, she would always love him, and uh, just to give him that sense of comfort. Because I think what happens is, for a lot of people is that I wasn't there. I missed that. I couldn't give them what they needed. In the so being able to facilitate that as a counselor is very tricky. Not everyone's going to want to go there. You can certainly ask them, would it be comforting to you if you had been there? I have a friend who is an um, art therapist, and she's done similar things to this. Uh, for example, people that have passed away, and she's created, um, out of clay, she's done like dioramas, where she actually created um, a, a clay model of them in the situation so that they were there and experienced it along with everybody else. And extremely healing for them. I think that uh, it's a tough one. It's not necessarily going to be one that everybody wants to use, but I think with a little creativity, it can be. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we also have a, a question in terms of um, how do we work with clients who may be using alcohol or drugs to cope with their grief? Boy, excellent questions here today. I think people self-medicate. You know, sometimes this is super intense, and they they don't want to cope. The thing about um, alcohol is, we know alcohol is a depressant, and so that's a very important variable to consider as well. If someone has a pre-morbid um, depression and then they're using alcohol, they can be very unsafe, um, especially if the the loss is quite sudden. They can be more at risk to have impulsive acts, such as suiciding themselves. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, if they don't, and if this is just that they're trying to numb the pain, 
quite understandable. It's about having dialogue with them to see if this is something that they are open to making some changes in. You may consider recommending um, some, some harm reduction strategies. Um, you may uh, involve an addictions support person. We have uh, an, an excellent bunch on our team here in health. And so they would look specifically at harm reduction. And um, the other part is, of course, is if they're not open to making those changes, it's about making sure that the safety is present even while using. Um, and I think that is the critical piece that I would share with any, with any type of question. You have to be safe before you And so if they have that, that awareness that, you know, using this amount is actually putting them at risk and it's difficult to address the grief, they may be more amenable to look. Excellent. I think we still have time for a few more questions. Good. Um, what are your thoughts on group work um, for grief? I think that group work is always a wonderful thing. Um, there's a lot of different models out there in terms of grief work. There are some more psychoeducational models that uh, basically just kind of educate people about what grief is so that they can follow along as they go through their process. I think um, there's probably a lot of different ones that are more therapeutic in nature as well. I think with regards to group work, you need to make sure that the delivery model is what your clients need. If you have somebody that's experiencing complicated grief and they're just not able to get their head around the fact that they had a loss, probably not going to be a good candidate for it because they're trying to avoid any um, acknowledgement that loss has occurred. I think it's going to be a very individual thing. Certainly within the context of group work, there's a lot of validation and normal normalization that the things that people are going through are, are normal and, and people can relate to it and people can spin off into wonderful peer support models. So I think that, again, it's about determining what type of group work you want to offer and uh, if it really fits with the client. But group work is always a really powerful approach. Excellent. Um, our next question is, are there particular techniques you would recommend for people dealing with anticipatory grief? Wow, I feel like I'm like a, a contestant on a, like a beauty pageant here. This is, these are really good questions. <laughs> but I wouldn't, I wouldn't meet the basic requirements for the beauty pageant. But uh, <laughs> so anticipatory grief is grief. Um, and I think you can still do a lot of these. You can still write letters. You can still have the uh, the chair exercise. You can still do a lot of that stuff. It's also, depending on the type of relationship, I've certainly had clients whose loved ones were dying, that they had unresolved issues with anger and grief, and we've done all of these things. Uh, and it still works the same. I don't think you need to actually have the finality of death to feel that you know these issues can be in ways. Again, it's just about being creative in, in the application. Um, you can still write a letter to someone even if they're alive. You can still write a playlist, create a playlist talking about the relationship. Either. So, you know, I, I don't think that that is the variable that needs to, uh, to impact your ability to use this. The variable that would probably be most appropriate would be, is the client open to them? Would that be meaningful? And, you know, the other part is, is if you look through those two books that I mentioned to you, there are so many more that you might feel, hey, this might fit a little better for my client. So by all means, these are just some of the ones that I like to use. Check them out. Loads of great ones. Excellent. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, another uh, person had asked if a, an individual can have characteristics of both adaptive and complicated grief. Absolutely. I think that's the part that you need to stick with, though. Like, you can have uh, adaptation, uh, good ad adaptations in some things, and there may be ways that they are stuck. This is where it gets a little bit murky. But if there are some things that um, they're experiencing some difficulty moving through, I think that's a really great opportunity to kind of put the, put the spotlight on it and say, you know, I'm just wondering about this because it seems like this is a real struggle for you. What do you think is going on? Um, and just to get the client's insight into where those things might be coming from is a really great uh, place to start in terms of developing a treatment plan. But, you know, we are people, we're individuals, we're not going to all look the same, and people are going to have different approaches to how they grieve. It's not going to fit in a box every time. And just because somebody is having 
um, you know, in a, a situation where adaptive grief doesn't mean it's not going to be really, really hard for them. It just means that they're not they're not getting hemmed up, they're not getting stuck, but it still could be excruciatingly painful. So I don't want to make it sound like, oh yes, for the people going through adaptive grief, it's not a big deal. It's still a very big deal, but it can be very um, complicated if there's some things that they're not moving. So you know, these are things to consider that uh, you kind of throw that out there to the client and just, hey, you know, maybe we can address some of those things. Is there something that's keeping you from moving? Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we also have a question around, do you recommend that clients see a GP before initiating therapy to ensure there is no unaddressed underlying medical conditions contributing to symptoms associated with the loss? I don't. Um, but I mean, I work at a mental health clinic where we do have psychiatry, which is uh, they are available to consult. I think that I, I recommended, you know, having in the medical part if you feel that the client is not safe. And that's what it comes down to. Or if the client themselves has experienced some dramatic shift. If the client is talking about not being safe, they, they can't guarantee that they not suicide, or there's been such a dramatic deterioration in their mood that you are concerned, by all means, pull in the GP um, within your circle of care. If they're involved with a psychiatrist, by all means, redirect back to them. Um, it, it all boils down to um, safety. So, for example, if somebody came in and they were experiencing um, depression or grief, but they felt that they were okay, then I don't think that's as, as essential. I don't think it's ever a bad thing to have your medical team as part of your circle of care because, you know, it's really not one person's responsibility. It, it has to be a team approach. You don't want to take on something that's going to just as well, and it shouldn't be all on your shoulders. So, again, I would really only suggest that, you know, going to the GP is, is an issue if you feel that there is any eminent risk to the client. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, what happens if a person is dealing with complex grieving, but instead of being, uh, you know, so looking at depression, the person has a profound rage or anger? Well, we know that anger is certainly a part of depression, but we also know it's part of grief. So it could be one of those things that you need to sort of figure out where is it coming from. Is it coming from a depression that isn't being treated in a way that maybe it needs to be treated? Or is this part of just the, the stages of grief as well? Um, it's really common to feel angry. I mean, you know, who is happy that somebody that they love passed away? I mean, it's, it's anger-inducing for certain. So it's about really trying to get a sense of where that anger is coming from. Is this, um, you know, a, a, a reflection that the person is not doing well with their uh, expression of grief? Or is this an expression uh, of an unresolved situation with depression, which could suggest that maybe they are not safe? So you really need to do your detective work there. I don't think it's ever a bad thing. I do a lot of work separately with anger, so anger doesn't scare me at all. Um, and we know that anger is, is a, a very natural and human emotion that we shouldn't feel shame and guilt about. The only issue that we have with anger is um, in the way that uh, if it's expressed in a way that hurts ourselves and hurts others, that's when it's an issue. So kind of normalizing the expression of anger and saying, you know, it's, it's completely understandable that you would feel anger. Is this causing trouble for you in your life as well? And understanding then with them as as we sort of take away that shame and guilt attached to the expression of anger is, you know, to try to figure out where the origin is so that you can address it. Wonderful. I think we may have time for another question or two. Uh, in your experience, are there particular, particular approaches that work most effectively with clients with whom cultural or religious expectations, for example, of widowhood is a significant factor? What a fantastic question. <laughs> Thank you very much, whoever gave you that question. No, I have not um, had an issue with that from a cultural point of view, but I imagine that would be certainly a really big consideration. Um, and I think what I might do in a situation like that, if I ever present it, and who knows, we certainly are becoming much more multicultural here in uh, the land these days, is to talk to them about, you know, I thought maybe we could try this approach. What do you think about this? Would this be something comfortable with? Um, and you know what? If they don't feel comfortable with it, you try something else. I don't think this is a cookie-cutter approach. 
and uh, this applies to cultural issues or, you know, uh, sometimes people are not interested in writing. That's okay. Sometimes people don't like music. That's okay, too. So it's about really uh, trying to figure out what might work best. I do find is generally, though, writing is pretty is pretty safe. Okay? because um, but, but again, you may have literacy issues. You may have all kinds of different things. So I'm sorry I don't have anything specific for cultural, but I think that's an excellent question. And I would just be like really transparent with my client and say, hey, I want to be mindful of where you're coming from from a cultural point of view. And I had a couple of ideas, and I'm just wondering if any of these maybe might be might resonate for you. Wonderful. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, there's still questions coming in, and unfortunately, we can't uh, can't get to everyone. Uh, but we do thank you for all those wonderful questions, and it's certainly been very engaging in that regard to have those questions come in, and um, and we'll have a look at those questions following the event as well. But uh, we do need to wrap up, um, so I would like to just take this opportunity to thank Elizabeth for this stellar presentation and question and answer period and for sharing her knowledge and expertise with us today. It is always so beneficial when we can come together to enhance our practice skills in clinical practice. And I've been hearing from lots of people online saying how valuable they found today's session. Elizabeth, you covered a lot of important information in such a small time frame, information that will certainly enable us to reflect on our own competencies and skills. It's through this type of knowledge exchange and continued learning that we can strengthen our practices, engage in positive social work relationships, and promote the best interests of our clients. So thank you again for facilitating this session, and it's truly appreciated. Again, I just want to make a note that the recording of this presentation and all the slides will be uploaded to the CASW website and the NLASW website for your reference. Some of the uh, questions that came in were around uh, the slides, so those will be available. For those of you who have attended 75 minutes or more of this presentation, you will now see confirmation. You can now uh, confirm attendance uh, by clicking the yellow icon at the bottom right of your window, and so you should see that come up there now. Uh, so again, uh, thank you for uh, your online attendance today. Uh, it was a great topic, and it was wonderful to have Elizabeth here in the office with me and, and doing this session. Uh, I'd heard a snippet of the presentation before and thought this would make for a great national webinar, so I'm so appreciative that Elizabeth was able to do that for us. Uh, the response was so great. We had, like I said, over 770 people who were registered. Um, so, uh, And the recording of this event, for those of you who have colleagues who have not been able to join today, the recording will be available. So you can share that with your colleagues, and they can tap in and uh, listen to Elizabeth Shepherd Hewitt. On that note, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day, no matter what time zone you're in. I don't know if Elizabeth wanted to say uh, one more thing. Yes, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for those great questions and for being uh, such a great audience. And it's really always terrific to see that there's so much interest in clinical skills. It's a big passion of mine. And so to hear that 777 people were also passionate about that was really exciting for us. So thank you so much for being part of this. And I'm really, uh, I'm really humbled to be part of such, a, such an exciting event. Thank you very much. And thank you. Bye, everyone.